The Legend of Zelda For as long as I've been alive, The Legend of Zelda has had a grip on the industry that no other franchise can attain. Yeah, Mario is worthy competition, but over the years it's become all the more apparent that Zelda understands what it needs to do to captivate an audience. Sure, it may not reach the same number of sales a franchise like Pokemon does, but can any franchise claim that? No, Zelda captures a part of us that these big corporations often neglect when releasing a game, the real estate in our minds. Whenever anything new with Zelda shows up, collectively we as gamers are like, Oh my god, it's Zelda! Did you see that new trailer? Holy shit, this is going to be the greatest game of all time! It not only captures something no other franchise is capable of, but it constantly innovates, driving our industry forward. If you're having trouble understanding what I mean, let me provide a few examples. Ocarina of Time changed gaming forever by taking concepts used in the 2D games and expanding them across a large landscape, giving an unrivaled sense of scale for the time. Majora's Mask was able to capture the emotional side, telling a dark yet beautiful tale focused on its citizens, rather than its world. Wind Waker vastly changed the tone we saw the franchise, and captured a childlike wonder throughout its adventure. Twilight Princess takes the cuddly characters we love and takes it in a direction tailored for a more mature audience. Zelda can just do anything and achieve a level of success nobody can match. It's just built different. I've mentioned in the past that new games show up on storefronts literally every day. Think of an idea and it's probably already been realized. But not Zelda. It doesn't matter what ideas are thrown at the wall. Zelda just seems to stick the landing. Or does it? I may be speaking out of turn here, but I've never really got what it is that makes Zelda such an appealing prospect today. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I hate the franchise. Not at all. I wouldn't be talking about it today if I did. But I'd be lying if I said I was on the same page with just about everyone else when people say, this Zelda game is the greatest game of all time. I'm not arrogant enough to say that these people are wrong. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But to me, Zelda just ain't all that today. The whimsy and charm of the franchise no longer resonates with me the same way it does my peers. And there's one title that made me come to this conclusion, arguably regarded as the greatest game of all time. A title that achieved something far greater than its predecessor did back in 1998. A title for the longest time I wasn't a huge fan of. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild The first major shift for the franchise since Ocarina of Time, the game that brought this legendary franchise into the third dimension. When I think of Breath of the Wild, I think of it less as a game and more as an enigma. I picked it up on launch day with my Switch, I had a blast for maybe the first 20 hours, but eventually I was asking myself, is this it? A sentiment not shared amongst the general populace. Snackago, what do you mean? They changed everything! It's a brand new experience! But is it? I mean, to me, it seems like the Zelda I know with a few new mechanics and a massive open world environment. Sure, the context of what you were doing was different, but by the end of my time with my first playthrough, one I never finished, I felt like I was just going through the motions. I got bored of doing the same shrine challenges over and over. I got bored of looking for Cocos. I got bored of climbing the same wall for the hundredth time. And to me, when a game gets boring, that's when I know that it isn't for me. Sure, I've played worse games, but if I started to get bored like I did with Breath of the Wild, I start to question why I started the adventure in the first place. Let's talk about that word for a second, adventure. The word adventure is defined as an unusual and exciting, typically hazardous experience or activity. Sure, Breath of the Wild captures the hazardous part of this definition, but unusual? I don't know. Maybe I'm just too woke to see it, but nothing really felt out of the ordinary in Breath of the Wild besides the new mechanics added in like jumping and climbing. And exciting? Sure, maybe at first, but doing the same thing over and over again on repeat doesn't exactly get me hype if you get what I'm saying. I've had a razor-focused eye on Tears of the Kingdom because I believe there's quite a bit that can be improved in Breath of the Wild. I'm just not seeing what most people are seeing, so maybe it's a me problem. So when my buddy said, hey, let's see if we can beat Breath of the Wild before Tears of the Kingdom comes out, I was a bit apprehensive at first. Let alone the stuff I want to talk about with you guys here on the channel. There's so many other games I'd rather play if I'm being honest. But I thought, you know, I have a lot of negative thoughts on this game. Maybe I should give it a second chance. And boy was I glad I did. I found myself having way more fun, sharing that adventure with my friends, approaching the game with a different mindset. I found myself thinking about Breath of the Wild almost every day, the same thought process everyone else had back in 2017. I found myself trying things I didn't think was possible in a video game, 
Simply put, it started making sense, and it was on this playthrough where I finally got the brilliance Nintendo was able to capture, for better and for worse. It's here when I finally understood The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Hyrule once again. So here's the thing with Breath of the Wild. Everyone's talked about this game before. I think it'd be rather tedious and repetitive to break down Breath of the Wild because you can watch that elsewhere. And quite frankly, I don't think that would make for an interesting video for you watching and for me creating. I'd rather focus on Breath of the Wild from a more abstract perspective and look at it in comparison to a few games I think captured that Zelda feeling better than anything else in the franchise, including Breath of the Wild. I may understand this game a lot more and why it's such a quote unquote special title, but even still, it's far from my favorite. The titles I'll be focusing on alongside Breath of the Wild are Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess. These two titles in my opinion capture that Zelda feeling that has been prevalent for a majority of our lifetimes better than any other. It's ironic that I'd choose these titles, seeing as they're arguably two of the most divisive in the entire franchise. I don't know, maybe I'm a contrarian? Seems pretty accurate. What they lack in scale, I feel that Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess use the limited space they do have to fully flesh out their versions of Hyrule, or in Majora's case Termina. They feel lived in. Every NPC feels like they have this crazy story just waiting to be told. And through these stories I get to see more of the world. Places I could only imagine during the days of my youth. When I think of side content, the first thing that comes to my head is Majora's Mask. Instead of just focusing on saving the world or whatever, it's not afraid to slow down and have you help out one of the citizens of Termina out with what may seem as a mundane task. Help this old lady out so she doesn't get robbed of the item she's going to sell in her store, which allows you to get an item that'll be useful to you at some point. Give this random floating hand some paper, so he can presumably wipe his ass from the massive shit he just took. It's the little things that matter. You're not just the hero of time, you're just like everyone else, dealing with the same problems as everyone else. No side quest encapsulates this philosophy like the Anju and Kafe side quest. Reuniting two lovers may seem a bit out there, but think of why Link left Hyrule in the first place. To find his partner who shared the struggle of saving Hyrule alongside him. Navi left Hyrule or got lost or whatever, and Link leaves the land he saved behind to go find his friend. To me, Majora's Mask takes everything Ocarina of Time did and elevated it to a new level. It's not your tradition of Zelda game, similar to Breath of the Wild, but it's able to capture that Zelda feeling I'm looking for while giving me a whole lot of other things to do. It adds a unique gimmick I love with you being timed to save the world. Let's be real, did Hyrule ever really feel in danger in Ocarina of Time? Seriously ask yourself that. When you have all the time in the world to get what you need to get done, it kind of takes you out of that mindset that you need to save everyone as fast as possible. Even even if Ganondorf had a seven year head start to enact his plan. Being timed and more importantly manipulating time really sets the stage for the stakes in this tale. When that clock is ticking, you just feel that you need to take care of business as quickly as possible so you can reset time and start all over. With Twilight Princess, the threat of Ganondorf and his forces are a constant presence. It's not like Ocarina of Time or the only real place that's affected is the castle. The whole world is covered in this dark matter the game calls Twilight. In this world, the citizens of Hyrule aren't even fully sentient beings. The only conceivable being of their existence is their soul. Link can't even assume his human form in this world. Being transformed into a wolf, which depending on your point of view can be looked at as both a being of light or a being of darkness. When the people of Hyrule look upon Link in his wolf form, he's regarded in the same light as all the other creatures working for Ganondorf. A monster. That feeling of being transformed back into Link's human form for the first time, after tearing through the darkness to find the few tears of light present, rocking the legendary garb of the hero of time himself. It's, for lack of a better term, euphoric. The culmination of all your hard work collecting those tears for the first time, and your reward is officially being named the chosen hero to save the land of Hyrule once again? It feels earned. All the time you spent getting to this point feels justified. Why am I saying all this? Well, it's because I want to illustrate what I believe makes Zelda this legendary franchise. It's not just the mechanics that make Zelda what it is. It simply recognizes what it needs to accomplish to make you feel like you're not only an adventurer, but a hero. 
When it comes to Breath of the Wild though, at first I really didn't understand the hook of the adventure. If I can hypothetically start the game and fight the final boss right after I've started, that sense of growth is superfluous. Obviously it would be ridiculously difficult to even tackle the final boss at that point in the game, but the possibility of it there is something I can't just ignore. Why have this huge world with all this stuff to do in it when you can just go behind Ganon's house and give him the quick bap bap to end things off? I appreciate player choice finally being added into the franchise, but I think it misses the point of what a Zelda game should be. At least that's what I thought when I initially played the game. For context, I did all of the Divine Beasts, checked a decent amount of the shrines, found very few Cocos, and I didn't collect any of the memories. It was around the time I had to face Ganon where I put the controller down for what would eventually be six years. Like I said, after a while, I got really bored. I just wasn't compelled to see the adventure through. That feeling of utter despair I felt through Twilight Princess is lost. The weight and emotions each NPC had in Majora's Mask, also just lost. It's a huge world, sure, but it feels kind of empty. Like I have this massive playground, but I go here and there's nothing. I climb this wall and nothing. I paraglide down this mountain and would you look at that? Nothing. Of course, there's literally things there and stuff to do, but it's so surface level that it's something I'd rather avoid. I had enough of Breath of the Wild, but when Tears of the Kingdom finally got its proper reveal, I was intrigued. So when my buddy asked me to play Breath of the Wild again, I figured, why not? And I finally understood what everyone else was saying. I got the hype. Breath of the Wild is quite the large experience, so let's not waste any more time. To be honest, I have no real reason to think that will be the case. But there's always the chance that the next moment will change everything. Picking up a game you put down after a few years can be quite the daunting task. And I haven't dived back into Breath of the Wild since its initial launch. Sure, I jumped in from time to time, maybe to show a buddy what Breath of the Wild was like if they hadn't played it before, or to capture footage for another video. But I never dived back in to actually play the game if that makes any sense. I had experienced what I wanted to and was content with the time I had put in. I don't know though, this time it was different. Maybe it was because my buddies and I all got together and played IRL, but the whimsy I felt that first time I turned the game on in 2017 quickly overtook me. I was having a blast, chatting with my buddies, running around looking for a specific set of armor, fighting enemies in the coolest way I could imagine. I was shocked. How could a game I thought pretty poorly have changed my mind so drastically? For someone as stubborn as me, it's quite frankly a miracle. But when that aha moment hit me, I just knew that on its own, Breath of the Wild is all that in a bag of chips. I do mean that a bit literally, but we'll get to that later. I know I said I wasn't going to be breaking the game down to the most minute detail, but for the sake of clarity, let me dive a bit deeper. Breath of the Wild bucks the traditional 3D Zelda formula we've all become accustomed to. Instead of having a linear path in terms of tackling the dungeons, you have free reign to go wherever you want. Like I mentioned, you can literally go and fight Ganon directly after the tutorial area. I don't recommend it, but hey, if you're a speedrunner or a masochist, go for it. So yeah, the world is literally your oyster. Go and do whatever the hell you want. Want to go and explore the Gerudo area? Typically save for the second set of dungeons after you've got the Master Sword? Go for it. Want to go to the volcanic Goron City where you'll instantly burn into flames if you don't have the right equipment? Go ahead. Hell, if you want to just go and dick around just exploring the expansive playground Nintendo has created here, what's stopping you other than yourself? Literally, you can look at something and be like, Oh, that looks cool. I want to go check that out. And then you just go and do it. It's pretty cool, I'm not going to lie. I mean, that's the hook of this game. Once you understand the big differences Breath of the Wild makes to cater to its world, you really start to see why people like it so much. You could gather a room of people together, have them play like 10 hours of Breath of the Wild, and everyone, literally everyone, will have experienced the game differently. They might have gone north while you decided to go south. You get what I mean. Personally, I decided to go to Gerudo Village first. I remember it being the most difficult and I figured the best way to work off the rust was going against the hardest of the four divine beasts. It was frustrating, but it added the tension I originally felt was lacking from this game. I don't know, it just felt like the right way to do things. To be fair, when me and my friends sat together, all of our switches in hand, we each decided we would each start on a different divine beast. One of my friends went with the Zora Temple, my other friend went to Goron Mountain, so I ended up just flipping a coin. It not only creates an interesting game environment for you to explore, it also creates a unique environment amongst the community of the players of Breath of the Wild, and that's kind of impressive considering what type of game this is. Sure, I mean if you play a game that you really like, Odds are you're going to be sharing that with your buddies, talking about things you liked, so on and so forth. 
But the level of interaction Breath of the Wild had not only back in 2017, but even today, one can say is unrivaled. People can talk about this game endlessly, and a lot of that is just how big things are, and the freedom you have in it. But I mean this world wouldn't be all that interesting if you know how Zelda movement typically works. I may love the old games, but to say they felt smooth to move through would be a tad disingenuous. It worked, but every Zelda game had a level of jank you had to come to terms with so you could explore. Of course, each Zelda game has a few different movement options like riding around on your horse Epona, or an item that gives you a speed boost. Regardless, it's safe to say the reason you were playing a Zelda game definitely wasn't the movement, so it would be kind of annoying having to deal with any sort of stiff movement. And of course, Nintendo made a few changes to accommodate. One change I never thought we'd see that I'm forever grateful for is the ability to jump. Yeah buddy, finally after god what, 19 years and 5 different entries you can jump in a 3D Zelda. Sure the jump is nothing more than a glorified hop, but when you look at the verticality present in Breath of the Wild, it goes a long way in terms of traversal. It may not be the jump we've been asking for, but it's at the very least a start, and I can appreciate that. That's not all that's new. Of course, we have single-handedly the most game-changing mechanic added into Breath of the Wild that in my opinion changes how we should view open world games going forward. That's right, baby. Free form climbing. Nearly every surface in Hyrule is climbable, and I mean, I don't even really need to go into it for you to understand why this is such a big deal. Sure, it can be tedious from time to time, but the fact I can literally just see a mountain and think to myself, hmm, I wonder if I can make that climb, and then I go ahead and just do it is just sick as fuck. You ever play an open world game, look at the map and realize it's on some mountain where you can only take a specific path? That's boring. It almost ends up feeling like the game plays itself. But having the ability to essentially approach any obstacle from any angle adds depth to the way you traverse the world. If this wasn't in the game, I guarantee you this game would not be as highly rated as it is. And it's a mechanic that needs to continue being improved upon as the series goes forward. And finishing off, we of course have paragliding. Man, there's nothing like climbing up a mountain to get a better view of your current location and then just yeeting yourself off the edge to glide your way to your intended location. It never gets old. You'll finish your climb and even if you're not intending to jump off and glide, consciously you'll just want that thrill of soaring through the skies. You know, it's pretty funny. It's almost like I've seen this before. Oh god, not you! That's what Breath of the Wild nails. It takes the mechanics from all the previous entries and for the most part improves on what those games did to just add more stuff for you to do in the sandbox. The paragliding and stamina wheel? Those are just improved versions of the sky sail and stamina meter from Skyward Sword. The combat takes inspiration from the advancements made in Twilight Princess. The open, expansive world is exactly what Ocarina of Time tried to capture back in 1998. Seeing as this game is at the bottom of the Zelda timeline, it's only fitting that all the other legendary heroes from Link's past affect what he's able to do here. But I mean originality and the tie-ins or whatever can only go so far. Even on my second playthrough, I did get fatigued from all the climbing, all the paragliding, just kind of everything. Of course, when you see it for the first time, you can unsee it. The Link you know and love interacting with this world in such a different way than what you're used to. But in practice, maybe after you've played for four hours straight or something, it just starts to get jading. You'll have a task in mind, Fast travel to the closest point only to see a massive wall to tackle, and when you've done it like 30 times in one sitting, it just feels automated. And forget about it if you want to try and speed through it. I'm a firm believer the quick jump option while you're climbing is put there as a way to mess with you. Sure, it may get you up the wall faster, but the amount of stamina it sucks away is way more than necessary. I get that Link is just one dude or whatever, but if I'm losing a quarter of my stamina wheel in return for a minimal gain in distance, I don't even need to finish this sentence for you to see why this just doesn't work. Maybe Nintendo knew that players like me would be impatient as fuck, but jeez man, what's the point of this? Sure, you could just bang out a few shrines, and believe me, we'll talk about those in a bit, to get the stamina upgrade you need. But I mean, if I can see the top of the mountain from the start of my climb, I really don't think I should be punished for trying to get through it faster. I want to see more of the game, but at points it seems like Nintendo doesn't want me to until I have the required amount of stamina. And when it comes to the combat, oh boy, does it get stale insanely fast. In my opinion, I feel like the core of Breath of the Wild's combat was ripped straight from Twilight Princess. Of course with a few tweaks. Instead of having these special moves, you have a few basic slashes, you can do the spin rooney attack and the jump attack. Wow, that's like insanely basic. Man, remember when you'd knock down an enemy and finish them off with an ending blow and Link just goes... Ugh, that's just so satisfying. He just jumps in and screams his ass off to emphasize how strong the move you just used is. 
I guess our alternative is the many different weapons Link can use, but I find that inherently worse than flushing out Link's sword skills. The Sword of Evil's Bane, aka the Master Sword, is here, but I mean, I don't really feel like Link is much of a sword master when I'm using spears and hammers or whatever. For most people, this isn't really a problem because there's so many different weapons to use, but it kind of neglects the growth Link goes through when you can hypothetically not use a sword against your adversary. I appreciate the variety, but I think it was surface level at best. And of course, for some baffling reason, Breath of the Wild further ruins its weapon system with weapon degradation. Even the biggest fan of this game has to admit that weapon degradation is a change made for the worse. It takes away the thrill you get when you pick up a new weapon knowing that roughly 10 to 15 slashes later it'll break leaving you empty handed. If you're gonna tell me that weapon degradation incentivizes you as a player to explore more of the world, I'm sorry, you're just wrong. You're wrong because I shouldn't be exploring to find a new weapon. You should be exploring because you want to see a part of the world you haven't experienced. Exploration shouldn't be, oh my god, I can't wait to see what I'll get when I go to this area. It's supposed to be, wow, that looks neat, let me go check that out. It betrays Breath of the Wild's entire philosophy of exploration for the sake of exploration, and it doesn't look like it's going anywhere anytime soon. Let me give you an example. On my first playthrough, I was able to get the full Fierce Deity armor set, as well as the Fierce Deity sword from Majora's Mask. But if I know that the weapon is going to break after a few slashes, why would I want to use that weapon? Getting this armor set and weapon fully depends on if you have the Majora's Mask amiibo Nintendo launched alongside Breath of the Wild, and you can only use this amiibo once per day and there's a chance you might not get anything weapon related. There's a very real chance you'll redeem your amiibo for the day and get nothing you actually want. Yeah, fuck that. I'm not getting rid of this shiny baby forever. Piss off with that nonsense. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to be talking about how Breath of the Wild successfully won me over, but I can't ignore these small issues that take away from what is otherwise a really fun experience. For the people that think this game is perfect, I urge you to try picking it up again and telling me that you enjoy when your weapon breaks, or having to climb a wall you think you should be able to only for your stamina meter to run out. And look, I didn't let any of this shit get me down, I rolled with the punches, because there really is a lot of cool stuff in Breath of the Wild. Initially, when I learned that the dungeon structure from the previous games wouldn't be returning, I was a bit worried. Because for me, the level design crafted in the previous entries I always felt were masterfully crafted. If the open world lacked any depth, I know I would be rewarded for going through it with a sick dungeon with cool and unique puzzles. Look at the first dungeon in Twilight Princess for example. You'll walk over this bridge and see a small cutscene of it breaking after you've crossed. Well shit, how do I get back to the previous room? I can't just climb myself out of here. What the hell do I do? It's only after clearing the objective in this room where the puzzle makes sense. Once you save the monkey that's caged in here, which in and of itself is a simple yet fun puzzle, you realize that the animal you just saved is your way back into the previous room. Beautiful. Mwah. Cut it right there. It's simple yet effective, something almost every Zelda game has nailed with its puzzles. In Breath of the Wild, those are foregone for the Divine Beasts, which act as this game's main dungeons. It's pretty similar to Majora's Mask's structure of only having four dungeons, but putting them side by side and one clearly has a lot more thought and effort put into it. Not to take shots at Breath of the Wild, it's clearly focused on the open world more than it is its dungeons, but still going through the Divine Beasts just inherently isn't as fun as a traditional Zelda dungeon. Combined with the fact that visually they all look the same and act very similarly to each other and they all start to blend together. It's pretty cool that you're on these machine-like creatures or whatever, but the charm is instantly lost after you finish one of them. And what does Breath of the Wild do to supplement these somewhat boring and repetitive quote-unquote dungeons? Well, it introduces these mini puzzles in the form of shrines. Yeah, I told you we talk about these. Honestly, I could bash these too, but this video is long enough and I really should give some benefit of the doubt. They're fine. I mean, it's kind of annoying that these are reused all over the place, but honestly, I kind of get it. There's 120 shrines in Breath of the Wild, and honestly, it really is a lot to ask for unique mini puzzles for each of them, so I get the reused material. It was annoying that I spent an entire play session shrine hunting and I literally went into five different shrines only to be met with another minor or major test of strength, but whatever man, I can get over it. And the reward is pretty decent. You get one of these cool spirit orbs, which if you collect four of them, you can trade them in for either a heart container or a stamina vessel. If you're playing this game like it was intended, you're going to be doing a bunch of these so you can get enough hearts to unlock the master 
sword. So in retrospect, yeah, I can live with these. It's all right. They offer a nice change of pace if you get tired of exploring the sprawling open world. Although I don't really see why you would if you agree that this is the best Zelda game of all time. One thing I will give the shrines credit for is that you can tackle the puzzles in a multitude of different ways. I sat with my buddies when we first started our playthrough and we all eventually came to the same shrine at the same time and we all solved the puzzle in our own unique way. That's pretty cool. It aligns with the core philosophy that Breath of the Wild is going for, so kudos. These are neat. Okay, I think that's enough of the actual gameplay, and overall you can kinda tell my feelings are a bit mixed. For everything I can praise about Breath of the Wild, there's something small that bothers me. But honestly, is that really such a big deal? Are the problems I do have with the game enough to take away from how cool Breath of the Wild is? No, I don't think so. Because at the end of the day, I still had a lot of fun. Sure, I got frustrated when it would rain and I couldn't climb a wall for 5 minutes, but the game is so big that I could just go do something else. And honestly, all the games I enjoy admittedly have a few moments of frustration from time to time. So to label Breath of the Wild as some terrible experience experience because of something as small as weapon degradation would be blasphemous. Eventually I'll find a new, and arguably cooler weapon that'll be more useful to me in that given scenario. And yeah, the Divine Beasts aren't my thing, but I have this huge world to explore beyond the Divine Beasts. I can take 20 minutes of my time to do some boring dungeon knowing that this expansive sandbox is just waiting for me at the end of it. Simply put, Breath of the Wild has so much going on that even if there's something I don't like, there's something equally or even better that I do like. I still don't think this game is all that, but I do recognize its strengths, and I'd be lying to you if I were to say I didn't enjoy myself. But of course, Zelda is known for so much more than the gameplay. And have proven yourself worthy of the blessings of the goddess Hylia. Whether skyward bound, adrift in time, or steeped in the glowing embers of twilight, a hundred years ago, a force we're all too familiar with lays waste to the land of Hyrule. This force is known as Calamity Ganon. Despite their best efforts, our heroes are eventually defeated by Calamity Ganon, and the only hope remaining is for Princess Zelda to battle the Calamity alone while her chosen knight, Link, recovers from his injuries from the ensuing battle. Eventually, Link wakes up in the Shrine of Resurrection. However, with the time that's passed, he seems to have a foggy memory of the events that occurred. Upon meeting with an old ally, Impa, Link starts to remember a bit of what took place a hundred years ago. Link learns that the technological advancements that were made were taken over by Calamity Ganon during the Great War that took place. Link's task is simple. Defeat the beings taking over the Divine Beasts, and use them to assist you in your fight against Calamity Ganon, and to save Princess Zelda. And that's it! Okay, nah, I'm joking. Obviously there's more to it, but honestly I don't feel the need to go through it. It's the same thing as before. Do X things so you can eventually fight Ganon or Ganondorf or whoever to save Princess Zelda from her imprisonment. You can go around regaining Link's memories by going to a few key locations. And while I do enjoy these, it's not a form of storytelling I enjoy very much. It takes a very specific way of storytelling to capture my attention. And constantly going back to what happened, rather than focus on what could happen, has never really been my cup of tea. It needs to be executed super well for me to get any sort of enjoyment out of this. And unfortunately, I don't think Breath of the Wild really nails it. Don't get me wrong, I do enjoy these memories to a degree, but not for the reasons I typically look for. Instead of building the plot organically, I mean they do. These memories in my opinion are focused on fleshing out the key players in this adventure. Of course we have Zelda, and I think this may be the best story the character Zelda has ever had. Rather than being the princess who has the power to do whatever it is to assist Link in destroying Ganon, the story focuses on Zelda coming to terms with her responsibilities as the chosen princess meant to assist the legendary hero in the struggle against the incarnation of evil itself. We get to see Zelda come to terms with her responsibility in a tangible way through these small scenes, and it actually makes you want to go through the dangerous journey you have to do so you can save her. No longer are you just saving this almost mythical being that's meant to save the land alongside Link. You're saving someone who's a friend. It adds emotional weight to every encounter with one of Ganon's goons because you know it leads to saving someone Link genuinely cares about. And it doesn't stop there. Each of the champions tasked with mounting the Divine Beasts all have to be saved. Kinda. It's been a hundred years so these guys are long dead. But their spirits, arguably the thing that matters the most in this franchise, needs to be saved from the being Ganon sent to overtake the Divine Beasts. They also show up in the memories you can find littered across Hyrule, and while they aren't as fleshed out as Zelda's story, I still really enjoyed these small scenes of Link just kinda hanging out with his friends. I freaking love Rivali and Daruk. Man, every time these guys showed up on screen I was entertained in some fashion and really, can I ask more than that for a story crafted for children? And you know the rest. 
do the thing, get the thing you need to to help you beat Ganon, and then go and face the man yourself. Or creature, I guess. Man, that final boss. Dare I say it's the best Ganon fight in the entire series? I do dare. The sense of scale when you walk into the chamber and the cutscene begins and the monster shows itself? I got goosebumps I haven't had in quite a long time. For the first time, I truly feel that a Zelda story was able to capture the feeling you get after the culmination of this long journey. That's not to disrespect the other titles. I'll preface. I still prefer those titles over Breath of the Wild by quite a bit. But you really feel like all the hours you spent saving Hyrule all comes together in a conclusive, epic final battle. And for the first time, at least in the gameplay, it's a true one-on-one. -on -one. Traditionally, Zelda will assist you in some way, but instead of being present, you still need to take in and out before you can save her, rather than saving her and then having the final battle. There's something quite ironic when you take on Calamity Ganon wearing the Phantom Ganon armor set you can find in the game, assuming you purchased the season pass, of course. Man, there's a lot of cool outfits now that I mention it. I think it's really neat that there's a Xenoblade 2 reference with Rex's outfit from Xenoblade 2. So for those of you that continue to pester me to play Xenoblade, Xenoblade, you can't do that anymore. I played Xenoblade, see? Just leave me alone, alright? That's besides the point though, and for as much as I enjoy this narrative, I do have to admit, it's rather hollow. Like I mentioned, seeing things in retrospect offers a unique perspective, but it makes things that happen in real time seem redundant. Link will have a specific conversation with one of his friends, you'll save them, and then have that same exact conversation after saving them? It's not a big deal, but it just feels kinda empty. And while the scale of the final boss is sick, the story just kinda ends. Sure, getting the memories gives you a nice little post credit scene, but I mean there's not much there either other than to plant seeds for the next game. Compare this story to the ones present in Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess and the problems become way more apparent. Twilight Princess is a story about having to come to terms with the destiny fate has in store for you. When you start the game, Link seems rather content with his life in Ordon Village. He has friends, a job, and a father figure watching out for him. He's happy to represent the village, but he doesn't seem too ambitious in terms of his destiny. He seems like the kind of guy that wants to build his life in his hometown. Obviously shit happens, and that's no longer a possibility. So Link has to pivot so he can protect those that matter to him, even if he can't walk the same path they do. Mid Edna, arguably the best assist character in the Zelda franchise, perfectly captures what I mean. She ran away from her responsibility. You know how the game's titled Twilight Princess? Well, spoiler alert, that's because Midna is the Twilight Princess herself. I could go on, but again, this video's long enough. Regarding Majora's Mask, it's a Zelda title that doesn't even feature the princess herself besides a cameo early on in the adventure. Rather, Majora's Mask focuses on the relationships you cultivate with the wide roster of characters present in Termina. Yes, including the main antagonist. It focuses on coming to terms with the concept of death, since the world is only three mere days away from annihilation. Sure, your journey is to stop the apocalypse from coming to pass, but the idea of death is present in nearly every interaction. For example, you'll learn the Song of Healing, a song meant to help ease the pain we struggle with in our day-to-day -day lives. When you head to Goron Village, you'll be met with the spirit of the legendary Goron hero, Darmani. He goes through what are commonly known as the five stages of grief, and it's only when Link plays the Song of Healing where he can truly accept that his time in the world is over. Ugh just every time pulls right at the heartstrings. My point with all this is that the emotional impact of the Zelda games I enjoy is a bit lost in Breath of the Wild. Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of emotional moments. When Daruk is looking over Hyrule after finishing his Divine Beast and he locks eyes with Yunobo, it's joyful, it's heartwarming, but to me, it's all just surface level. Maybe the two games I've been comparing Breath of the Wild to are just the outliers, but since they exist, and since their stories are so good, I can't ignore them. It's not bad, I just found it a bit disappointing. But I mean, like I've said before, the story really isn't the point here. Since the story isn't laid out in your traditional Zelda fashion, as in you engage with the story as you progress to each area, one could look at the story as the secondary goal, and I mean that in a good way. If you don't want to do Zora's Temple in favor of grinding out more shrines, that's totally a valid way to go about it. If you don't really care about the Master Sword, you don't have to waste your time to go and get it. Seeing as you need 13 hearts to actually pull it off its hilt, it could take a bit of grinding to get, which may be something you don't want to do. So why do it if you don't want to? And that's kind of where it all came together for me. That was the missing piece that really made all of it make sense. You must save her, my daughter, and do whatever it takes to annihilate Ganon. Somehow, Ganon has maintained control over all four divine beasts. When deciding to make this video, I struggled for a long time on the best way to describe Breath of the Wild in just one phrase. 
I went back and forth with myself for some little tagline that I could sum up everything I feel in regards to this game. Luckily though, I had a conversation with my roommate Kev, and he did all the hard work for me. If I were to sum up everything that this game is in one phrase, I'd say that The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is the perfect junk food game. Now before you come at me with pitchforks, allow me to elaborate. When you think of junk food, you might think of candy or a bag of chips. You wouldn't eat just one chip, would you? Nah, of course not. You'd keep grabbing more. Even if you're not hungry, you subconsciously just grab more until eventually you reach the bottom of the bag with nothing left. That's what I think Breath of the Wild is. None of the things you do in Breath of the Wild are inherently super interesting that you have to go and see what's at the edge of the mountain there. You just look at it and tell yourself, all right, just one more climb, then I'll be done. But when you finish that climb, you might see a shrine and say, all right, for real this time, just this shrine and I'm done. Until you're saying this for almost everything in the game, just one more. Like I said, junk food. This isn't a bad thing. I mean, I have the word snack in my name because just like the next guy, I love junk food. Snacks are one of my favorite things to munch on. But come on, compare a fine three course meal to a bag of Doritos or something and you'll clearly be drawn to one over the other. When it comes to Breath of the Wild, that philosophy is just as true. Sure, I can always come back to that bag of chips I really like. But when I want to treat myself, I'm going to be getting something much nicer and tastier than a snack. Do I think The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is the greatest game in the series? Nah man, this just ain't it. At the end of the day, I still prefer the more linear, story-focused Zelda games like the two I've been referencing because to me, that's always what Zelda is going to be. That's what I experienced as a kid, and for me, that's always how I'll think of Zelda going forward. A game like Majora's Mask being as special as it is, when it doesn't even have Zelda in it, is something we shouldn't take for granted. Reused assets and all. On the flip side though, is Breath of the Wild this boring mess of a game I thought it was back in like 2018? Nah man, it's pretty fun. I can highlight so many moments that had me grinning from ear to ear throughout my second playthrough. Seeing the introductory title reveal after finishing the Great Plateau. Finding Majora's Mask just behind one of the starting areas. Ravali roasting Link after he was chosen as the one to defeat Ganon. Pulling the Master Sword from its hilt while dressing as Phantom Ganon. All of it. I had a lot of fun playing Breath of the Wild this time around. And although I was a bit apprehensive at first, I'm really glad that I did. At the time of this video's release, the sequel to Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom, is right around the corner. I already have the day off from work scheduled so I can spend the entire day just seeing what's changed in Hyrule. Interacting with the new mechanics Tears will bring into the fold. Would I be doing that if I didn't like the core of what Breath of the Wild is? Of course not. I'm really glad I took the time to revisit a game I wasn't very fond of. It's something I rarely do. If I play a game and I don't enjoy my time, I don't shy away from putting it down and moving on to something I know will interest me more. Sure, I've talked about some bad games on this channel, but those games were able to capture my attention for some reason or another. Breath of the Wild bored me by the end of my first playthrough, and honestly, I don't care for games that do that. But upon a fresh playthrough, with a fresh perspective, I really enjoyed what Nintendo was able to achieve with this title. I'm really glad I went back to give this game another shot, because now, I finally understand The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I've been keeping watch over you all this time. I've witnessed your struggles to return to us, as well as your trials in battle. I always thought, no, I always believed that you would find a way to defeat Ganon. I never lost faith in you over these many years. Thank you, Link. The hero of Hyrule. May I ask, do you really remember me?